Huh? Yes. Doctrine of hell, yes, everyone must have cleared out, yes. Doctrine of hell, let's open up in a word of prayer and then, um, yeah, we'll get into it. Father, tell you, we love you, we thank you for your grace and your wonders. Thank you, Father, for the church we have. Thank you, Father, that, you know, today there are multiple um, uh, study groups for all ages in this church today um, being Bible students. And I pray as all of us, we're good Bible students, we learn and we take the Bible and we just um, get it right, Father. So help me now to be a good teacher. Uh, I pray, Father, you would um, instruct the, the people today and give me all the abilities and all of us today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the doctrine of hell. What is hell? Where is hell and why is there a hell? We need to understand hell. Uh, I don't know about you, but if it wasn't for the doctrine of hell talk to me, I probably wouldn't be here today because, you know, once you learn about hell, you sort of want to get your sins right, don't you? Um, the doctrine of hell goes back to the dawn of man. Um, it's not only taught in Christianity, it's taught in Judaism and many religions around the world over time about the doctrine of hell. So, you know, there must be a place like that. The world hell is mentioned 54 times in the Bible. In fact, if you get to the New Testament, Jesus talked more on hell than he did heaven. So today on this thing, it's not really what I want to say. I want to just go through the Bible and, and, and go through verses and see what God has to say about the doctrine of hell. Um, the first mention of hell in the Bible is in Deuteronomy in the Pentateuch and um, we know that Moses, God was leading through Moses, the children of Israel from Egypt into the promised land and there are a lot of rebellious Jews and just before they went into it um, th this is what God said he, the Bible says that they moved me to jealousy, that's the rebellious Jews that he's trying to get into the promised land, that which is not God they have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. Then he said, For a fire is kindled in my anger, this is what God says, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So, we see here straight away the first um, mention of hell. We see that is hell is made with fire. It's with fire. Why is there a place called hell? Because of the anger of God towards man. And it says about the lowest hell, so there are degrees of hell. There are degrees of hell, the lowest hell. All right, so where is hell? Where is this place called hell? Is it a far off place? Um, is it a near place? Well, this is what the Bible says, talking about hell and about the wicked, in the Psalms, it says, let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. Go down quick into hell. For wickedness is their dwellings and among them. So Psalm said, you need to go down into hell. Isaiah wrote, talking on hell, he said, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth, it is raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations, talking about all the wicked nations and the people, and it says, hell from beneath, from beneath. Amos wrote and said, though they dig into hell, so therefore you can dig your way into hell. So to go to hell, the Bible says that you need to, it goes down. It turns over and over, they go down, they go down, they go down. So wherever you stand on the earth and you go straight down, where do you end up? Center of the earth. Center of the earth. What's in the center of the earth? It's a very hot place, isn't it? So I'm not saying this there, but the Bible says that you have to go down and in the center of the earth there is a very hot place. Preachers once said that when volcanoes are up, it means God is enlarging hell for the souls of men. This is what Isaiah wrote about hell. He said, therefore hell hath enlarged herself. So hell's getting bigger. And as the world goes on, there's more sinners. And open her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp. And he that rejoiced it shall descend into it. So they all once again went down into hell. All right, we're dealing on that the doctrine of hell this morning. So we see that hell enlarges itself by opening up its mouth. So whether volcanoes were erupting is make a, God making more room for hell, I don't know. 
But as I says that hell enlarges itself by its opening up its mouth. We know that uh, God was leading uh, the children of Israel into the promised land by, Cor- uh, by Moses. And we know that Korah and a, bu- uh, a bunch of people rebelled against Moses. This is what the Bible says about those wicked people. God was very angry at them. And he talked about Korah, Korah and he said, they and all that are pain- appertain to them. So Korah and their families and all those that were with him, they said they went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the people. So we see that Korah, the earth opened alive, opened up, and they went down alive, straight down into the ground, into the pit. So we see the hell is also called the pit. The pit, the Bible calls it the pit. In fact, in the book of Job, when Job talks about hell, he calls it the pit. So we know that the hell is fire, it's for the anger of God, it's for the wicked. We see you go down into hell, so whether you're in Australia, wherever in the world, if you go straight down, you're going to go straight down to a meeting point into the centre of the earth, which is very hot. Next question. What does a person have to do to go to hell? What does, that's a very good question. What does a person on this earth have to do to go to hell? Well, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. So what does a person have to do to go to hell? Absolutely nothing. You don't have to do anything. You're going there. We are all going to hell from the moment we are old enough to be accountable for our sins. You know, we don't have to do anything to go to hell because that's where we're going. But we must certainly do something to escape from going there. And that's the reality of life. You know, we're all heading to hell because we're sinners. And if you don't want to go to hell, you've got to do something to get out of hell, don't you? The Bible says a person that is not going to heaven means they are what? Saved. Saved. That's a very important word when we say, have you been saved? You know, the Bible talks about, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Okay. For a person that is going to heaven means they're saved. Saved from what? The Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And Book of Acts talking about the Philippian uh, jailer. He ran out to Paul and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, when you say saved, saved from what? Being saved means that we, we are... What it means is that we're all going to hell like a ship that is sinking, right? On the Titanic. You're all on that ship. We are all of mankind going to this one place of destruction. All right? And you're on that sinking ship. And if the life raft comes from and it saves you from that sinking ship, you have been saved from a sinking ship. When the Bible talks about saved, it means you've been saved from hell. So when we are asked if we've been saved, it basically means have you been saved from hell and the judgment of God. That's what saved means. And missing hell is only because of the mercy of God, isn't it? Because the Bible says, For great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. From the lowest hell. For great is thy mercy. So that we all know that we're all going there. We have to be saved from it. And if we do get saved, we have to do something about it. And it's because of the mercy of God. All right. What does hell look like? What does hell look like? Um, can you open your Bibles to Luke 16? Very famous passage, and I want to look at this. It tells us a lot about hell. That's fine. This is Jesus. He's pulling no punches here. He's telling a straight down line truth about mankind. Luke 16, we'll start at verse 19. The Bible says there was a certain rich man that was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of swords and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to part that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom and the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and see Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Okay, we see a story about beggar Lazarus and a rich man. And they both died. They both died. And we read how the rich man died, and when his body died, 
he opened up his eyes and where was he? In hell. In hell. He died and then he opened up his eyes and he was in hell already. So for a lost person, going to hell is instantaneously the moment after they die. It's instant. You know, one second they're here, the next second they're in hell. And it sort of brings it home that if you're lost, the closest place to you is hell. You know, if you're lost today in our church service, it may take you five or ten minutes to get home to your bedroom and your safe place, but hell is closer than that. It's right there. The moment your heart stops beating. And then it goes on to say in verse 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me, and say in Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Okay, so this man, he's in hell. He's a rich man. It's not his physical body, but it's his soul. And when a soul is in hell, what we can see is this, that he can still see, he can still hear, he can still talk and he can still feel pain in the flames of hell. So in hell you still have all your senses. Okay. And in hell he also talks to Abraham and he asks that he would send Lazarus to warn him of his family. He's in hell, he's burning up and he's thinking about his family. And he says, For I have five brethren that I may testify lest they also come into this place of torment. You know, he's a man that's in hell and what's he thinking about? Evangelism, isn't he? You know, and it's a timely reminder of how important it is as a church here, the important evangelism and to warn people. But Abraham says to him, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. You know what he said? They're Jews, they have the Old Testament. And he said, Moses, he said the Old Testament, and they should hear what Moses wrote and the prophets wrote. So don't anyone tell you that the Old Testament can't save a person. The Old Testament preached and taught about hell and taught about how to get saved and how to be everything. In fact, if you take every verse in the New Testament on salvation, it was borrowed from the Old Testament. But he said the Word of God, the Old Testament, you know, they have it, they don't want to come here, they need to hear what Moses and the prophets wrote. And finally, he said... And the rich man said, he said, Nay, Father Abraham. He said, No, Father Abraham. But if one went to them from the dead, they will repent. Yet they were, they will repent. The rich man didn't believe in repentance, did he? But now he's in hell. He understands the importance of repentance to not go into heaven, not going to hell. Repentance. Now that he's in hell, he understands that a man must repent in order to be saved from hell. So what's a person got to do to be saved from hell? He's got to repent. You know, it's too late for this fellow. Once you die, you're going to be wanting to repent. But you don't have that chance. But before you die, you need to repent. And that's the basis of salvation, is repentance. As a man goes to God and says, God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry, I'm going to hell, and I don't want to go to hell, and I'm sorry for my sins. And they repent, and they change their life. So he talks about repentance, but Abraham says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, will they neither be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So it's important that the Moses and the prophets, the word of God, is more important and more convicting as how a man to be saved. The word of God, more than one raising from the dead, screaming about, don't go to hell. So that's important too for us, is that when we do preach the word of God to repent people, the importance is to stick to the word of God. Because it's the word of God that's powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we need to remember quote scriptures and things like that. But it's too late for this man. He's in hell. And this is what Abraham said. And he said, beside all this, he said, between us and you. This is Abraham. He's talking to, to the, the, the rich man. He can see Abraham. He can see Lazarus. He said, between us, there is a great gulf fixed. So they that which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass us that would come from hence. And he said, the biggest problem is this great gulf so that um, those that are in hell can't get to Abraham's bosom or can't get to that place of rest and they can't cross over. Abraham says you cannot escape hell once you're there. Once you're in hell, that's it. It's over. You've had all your times on this earth to repent, to choose God, to do it. You make those choices, okay? 
And once you're in hell, your family and your loved ones can't pray for you anymore because you've made them decisions. So this passage also doesn't just explain what happens to the lost when they get to, when they go to die. It also explains to the righteous and where we go after we die. And so rich men could see Abraham afar off as well as Lazarus being comforted. So Lazarus tells us what happens to those that when we get saved and when we die, where are we? Are we in torment? No, we're in comfort. The Bible said that Lazarus was carried by the angels to a place of comfort. The Bible says, In hell he lifted up his eyes being on, and see Abraham found and Lazarus in his bosom. So we see that both the rich man and Lazarus are in similar places, but not the same place. They're in the similar places, but not the same. They're in the same area, same place, but there's a great gulf between them. So what we see when the righteous die, they don't go to heaven, but to a place of comfort. Remember the thief on the cross, when he repented, and Jesus said, Oh Lord, and he said unto Jesus, the rich man said, I mean, not the, rich, the thief on the cross said to Jesus, he said, turn to him, and he said, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom, because the thief's on the cross, he's not far from dying. And Jesus said, and verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He said, paradise. So the saved, after they die, go to paradise, or Abraham's bosom, which is not heaven. And I'm going to explain more of that as the study goes on. Are you all right? Rightio. <coughs> In hell. Who won't be in hell? Who won't be in hell? All right. Despite all what the world and all the drawings say, Satan is not in hell, and nor are the devils or the demons. They're not in hell. Satan does not run hell. We see these pictures of Satan on his throne in hell in charge of, of, the, of hell and all the torment. No, that's not true. Satan is not in hell. That's not true. In Matthew, we read a story. Jesus is going along, and he's got his earthly ministry. And he comes to the other side, and what he sees is, he sees two men possessed with devils or demons, you know, fallen angels. And this is what he says. And the story goes to Matthew. He says, And when he was come to the other side of the country of Gergesenes, or whatever it is, there he met two possessed with devils, coming out of tombs exceedingly fierce, so that no man might pass that way. So we see that two men are possessed with devils, or demons. Okay? Devils are falling angels. And they weren't in hell, were they? Where were they? They were on earth in man's bodies. And this is what the response they gave Jesus. When they saw Jesus come, this is what they said. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? And he said, Out thou come hither to torment us before the time. They say to him, Jesus, are you come here to torment us before the time? In other words, they're not in torment yet, the devils and the demons. But they know there is a day and a time coming when they're going to be in torment. So are the demons and devil and Satan, are they in hell? No, they're not. Where's Satan's, um, where does Satan preside these days? As a roaring lion, he roams the earth. Yes, he is. He ain't in hell. He's scared of hell. He don't like that idea. He knows one day it's coming to him. You know, a place of torment. But in this time, he roams the earth, yeah, destroying man and man's lives and in governments and principalities and all the rest of it. So, the devil's not in hell. He's not in charge of hell. In fact, he's quite frightened of it. Okay, is hell forever? Once you die in your sins, are you in hell forever? When a loved one dies in their sins, will they be in hell forever? And the answer is no. They're not going to be in hell forever. The Bible doesn't teach that. And before you go all crazy, let me finish my study. Hell is not forever. Hell and paradise are a holding places for all the dead until a future event. Hell and paradise are a holding place. Paul wrote on, to, on this future event, and he's talking about talking to other Christians about their friends and their loved ones who have died in Christ. And this is what he says to them. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. In other words, those that have died, that ye sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
For this we say by, unto you by the word of the Lord, that they which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, or with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Than which we are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the Bible says that those that have died, he says they're not in heaven, he said they are asleep, a place of rest, paradise. But Paul talking about a future thing, he says the dead in Christ shall rise first. So they're not in heaven, are they? They are going to rise, the resurrection. There's a day coming when the resurrection, okay, you can't rise if you're in heaven, are you? Jesus simply put it this way. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net which was cast in the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels and cast the bad away. So there's net in, the good and the bad fish were in the same, but at the end of the day, they took it back to shore and then they separated the good fish from the bad fish. Okay? So one day the world will end, so we'll all be in a holding place until then, either in torment like the rich man or Lazarus in comfort of paradise. And then Jesus said, so shall it be at the end of the world. At the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Okay, so at the end of the world, the angels are going to separate the wicked from the just. So it adds to the notion that until then, the saved and lost are in the same place and the angels will come and separate them. When? At the end of the world. So, we see that when we die, there's a place called hell, there's a place called paradise, a place of rest, till the resurrection. After the end of the world and God separates us, what then? What then? Well, Hebrews 9, 27, as it appointed unto man once to die, then after this, the judgment. Judgment. At the end of the world, there is judgment. All men must be judged for all the things that they have done whether unto life or unto death. Everything we do. How many types of judgment does the Bible teach at the end of the world? Two. There are two. The judgment seat of the Christ and the great white throne. Okay. One for the saved like Lazarus. The other for the lost sinner like the rich man. They were both in different holding places until the time comes. The Bible says, for the righteous... What will the judgment of Christ be like? What's that about? What do you mean? One day if you're saved and you're serving God and you spent your life serving God and you're going to die, the Bible says, as Paul wrote, so why, but why dost thou judge thy brother and why dost thou say that naught, thy brother, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So we all will who are saved. When we are stand before the judgment seat of Christ as a saved person, what are we going to be judged on? It's important that we know that, don't we? What are we going to be judged on? This is what the Bible said. This is Paul wrote. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So it's a time of judgment. We're going to receive our own reward for the labor that we have done, personally. For we are laborers together with God, and ye are God's husbandry, another farming, and we are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man heed how he build thereupon. For other foundations can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Then this is what he says. If any man build upon this foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. So he says, our life is going to be like the foundation. It's going to be the gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. When we die, all our works in stone of Christ will be considered, is it wood, is it hay, is it gold, or precious gems? Then every man shall be made known or manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work, that sort of it. So in other words, all our life's work and hard work will go through the fire, the Bible says. And if any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And if any's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so by fire. In other words, he's saying, as Christians, one time we get saved, there are times where we just waste our time away and we do things that mean nothing. 
there are other times that we do things that mean a lot of things to God. And those things are the gold, silver, and precious stones. And when they go through a fire, they get refined and they come out and they survive. But all the times that we've wasted our life, you know, doing things that don't mean anything, watching TV or whatever those things, it's going to go through the fire and it just gets burned up. All right? We're not going to go to hell, are we? Because it didn't say that. Because, But he himself shall be saved, yet get saved by fire. So the judgment of Christ is for the Christians, for those that are holding place, the resurrection, we get judged. And then our life, since the time we get saved, will go through that fire. And while it's left over is what we get rewarded for. Okay? So we're going to be put for fire. All our tire mason will be burnt like up like straws. But what we did for Jesus will be refined and we're going to get rewarded for that. Crowns and all the rest of it. And at the end of it, Jesus said, this is what Jesus said in Matthew 20. And his Lord said, Well done, good and faithful service. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Then Jesus said, Enter in thou into the joy of the Lord. So after judgment, all the works we through the fire, we get rewarded. Then Jesus says, Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then after judgment, the righteous can go to heaven. We've been judged. But to the lost and unrepentant sinner, like the rich man, Jesus said the angels will sever him from among the just. The Bible says, So shall be at the end of the world, God will sever the wicked from among the just. That's a pretty pretty nasty sort of way. It's not like, you just move over here, the angel's going to sever them. You know, when you die in your sins, there is no more love from God. You're going to be severed. You're going to be cast. You know, it's going to be a very violent thing. To the unrepentant sinner, the Bible says there's a second judgment. It's called the Great White Throne. And the book of Revelation talks about this. And he said, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, and whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up their dead, which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to the works. It's going to be a very scary time in the future for these people to stand before God, a righteous, holy God, to be judged for everything they've done. But the day is coming when all men will be judged, and if you go through the great white throne, that means you're lost. What will be judged at the great white throne? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 21, But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account of thereof in the day of judgment. Every idle word, every idle word that you've said, every nasty thing you said, every horrible thing that you have said on the day of judgment and the great white throne, you're going to have to give an account for. For by the word shall thou be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Everything they speak will be judged. But then it goes on, and Paul wrote, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. They're going to have to be judged for the secrets of their hearts, the secrets things, the things that you thought of and you thought about other people and the sin and the wickedness, you know. Just because, you know, other people didn't hear it, just because it might have been in your own heart that you thought things and it was private. One day it's going to come out and you're going to have to give an account of on the day of judgment. And then a book will be opened. And God will ask the angel, is your name written in the book of life? It's going to happen. Every person, God's going to ask and say, is such and such name written? And if it's there, then they're going to heaven. If it's not named, the angel's going to say, such and such name. Their name's not in here. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You see, God keeps good record, doesn't he? He knows everything about you. And when you're lost... He's recorded everything that you've said, thought, done in your whole life, and you're going to have to give an account on the day of judgment. All right? And this should put fear in your heart. This is it. If you're lost here today, you need to be fearful because this is a real thing that will happen to you in your life. That one day you will die, and eventually you're going to have to stand before God and give an account of all this. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. 
How do you put your name in the book of life? Simple, you've got to repent of your sins. You've got to repent of your sins. Jesus plainly put it like this, They shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angel. That's the judgment day. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angel. So those on the left hand, two different judgment, okay? One on the right to glory, one on the left to eternal damnation. And lost and hell, and the lost that were in hell were tormented. And those that were in hell, where the devil and were not, they were judged. All right? Those who are in hell will one day be taken out of hell. They're going to be judged. And when they are judged and God's finished with that, they're thrown into a different fire and a different torment that was even worse than hell because it was made for the devil and the angels. You see, if you die in your sins, you're not going to get away with it just by being in hell for all eternity. You're going to be taken out and you're going to have to stand and give an account for it. Then you're going to go to a worse place called the lake of fire. And why there? Because you rejected God like the devil and his angels did many thousands of years ago. And those that are there are justly there. So hell is not forever, but the next punishment will be. The Bible says, In death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So hell is not forever because it gets cast into a, another one. Hell is not for If you died in your sins, you don't get away that easy being in hell. And the second one, the first one was called the pit. The second one's called the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit. And the Bible says this will be the end of the devil. And the Bible says the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Ever and ever. Hell is not forever, but the lake of fire will be forever. The Bible talks about, and the smoke of their torment is sent up forever, ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. There's a doctrine called annihilation that uh, the Jehovah's Witness and that say that when you die and you go to this place of um, like hell or the lake of fire, you're only there momentarily until your soul is burnt up. And I wish that was so, because, you know, I think about all the people that I know that have died and gone there. But unfortunately, the Bible says the smoke of the torment has sent it up forever and ever. And the truth is, damnation and the torment is forever. Paul wrote on the persecution of the righteous. And he talks about, when he's talking to the, he says to them, you know, I know you're getting persecuted. He's talking about his fellow people about that, you know, you're getting persecuted and you're getting picked on. And this is what he said. Seeing as the righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Paul says, God's going to deal with them. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be real from heaven and his mighty angels. In a flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Everlasting. Do you believe God gives everlasting life and that will be for everlasting? Well then, when he says it's everlasting punishment, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's everlasting. Everlasting. <clears throat> right. So that's just a basic st study on hell and heaven and after we die. And... Um, there's a lot more to it than what I just said today. There's a lot more to take into account. Um, I don't take in the verses about the rapture too much, thousand year reign, and other passages of the Bible that you need to take into account for everything that I've said today. And if you need to probably delve into a little bit more and trying to find out where all that fits in and stuff like that. But basically, that's what hell is about. It's a place by God. It's a place for torment. It's a place for punishment. Um, we're all going there unless we do something about it. Unless a man stops and thinks about his life and repents of his sin and calls upon the name of the Lord and puts his faith in Jesus Christ, then that's where he's going. And when they're there, they're there forever. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I just pray now you hand this, over to, this um, message over to you. Pray you do with it to what you will. Um, I really pray, Father, this morning that you pray our hearts for the next service. I pray, Father, that um, you have our hearts ready. And um, we now we just tell you we love you and we thank you now in Jesus' name.
Amen.